welcome to the show. Thank you. I appreciate being here. This is cool. Yeah, man. Well, this is exciting for me. Like we've been talking off air and in our correspondence leading up to today. Um, what we're going to talk about today is really near and dear to my heart. Um, I, but I don't want to jump ahead before we get to that point. Um, as you guys heard in the intro, you know, John is um, fortunate enough to uh, document the history and legacy of some of our finest heroes. And I guess in simple terms, I'll just kind of set the stage by saying, and I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing your own words, but you, you interview old pilots and draw pictures of their airplanes. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't get much more complicated <laughs> than that. Although, you know, now it's turned into filmmaking and uh, some other stuff, but right. I yeah, want right? to unpack <laughs> all of that. Yeah. yeah. I interview old guys and draw their airplanes. It's uh, my elevator speech, so to speak. I mean, it sounds like it, honestly, like my dream job, but how did you get into this passion? Uh, well, the, the passion of aviation, geez, I was born with it. I as a little kid and I loved to see airplanes and I, my dad built model airplanes and, uh, you know, what little kid isn't thrilled with, um, you know, how many, I mean, I, this isn't a model airplane, model airplane, but what little kid isn't thrilled by this, you know, a P-51 that you can fly around the living room. Uh, and my mom, she was a stay at home mom. And what she would do is she would get my dad's model, the boxes from my dad's model airplanes and the instructions. And this is before I went to even first grade. I mean, I was just like three and she would put the box uh, in front of me and put some crayons and some paper. And then she would say, okay, look at the, look at the cover and um, then draw what happened next. And hang on, I think, I wonder, I wonder, you know, I've got so much stuff here. Let me show you something. Go back to my little studio here. Like this, this is a model airplane box from my three-year-old childhood. That's awesome. And so my mom would put this on the, uh, on, on the kitchen table and she would say, well, draw what's next. Most of a World War I airplane, but I would then you know, write, draw, and then she would try to coach me through what, why my reasoning was for drawing the the next scene, so to speak. So I, I started uh, learning about all these pilots and aerial exploits at a very early age. And then my dad also had a stack of paperbacks that he had bought in the early 60s, and they were all the the stories of great World War II aviators. And that's literally how I learned to read. That is cool. <laughs> well, what better way to read than actually reading history? Right, right. Oh, totally. Uh, but but it, it gets weirder. You know, as I grew up, other kids would like collect, you know, baseball cards or stuff like that. And I was always kind of left out. I was going, well, there's not a Joe Foss card. <laughs> you know, right, right. <laughs> so but I didn't change. So I, I, I stuck with stuck with my uh, my interest in aviation. So did you have family members that served in any, any capacity? Well, my dad was in the army okay. and he was in the Corps of Engineers and he went on to be an engineer. But other than that, not really. Um, I grew up, you know, very, 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 very much on the tail end of the Vietnam War. And I remember, uh, I remember the military coming into our house through our television set. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just barely old enough to reach up and turn off the TV but my, my parents were, uh, my mother especially, was highly political. And so she would yell at the TV. And, and you know, th then there were also people in my hometown of Bismarck, North Dakota, that were Vietnam veterans. And they would come back. And then I'd get to meet them. And I, I learned about the, the ethos of the times. And one of the things that I learned about the Vietnam War was that as a little kid, I really didn't want to learn about the Vietnam War. I wanted to learn about World War II. <laughs> and so ironically today my life is mostly about the vietnam war but uh you know I, the military and its social implications were also imprinted pretty pretty well with me at a young age yeah my dad served during the vietnam era he was fortunate enough that he didn't ever go overseas and i think he has uh, some guilt about that, but I grew up knowing that my grandfather, so for the guys watching right now, <clears throat> and you've seen this in uh, other episodes, obviously, I've got 
uh, my my grandfather, my dad's dad, was a pilot of a B-17, and I've got his oh, air medals on the wall behind me, and then I've got his photo as well as photos of my other grandfather and my wife's grandfather. Wow. And so two of them were pilots and one was a Marine uh, who fought in uh, Guadalcanal and Iwo Jima. And so the military history kind of runs deep in my family, but I grew up with my, my grandfather, my dad's dad, the pilot of the B-17 had a tattoo on his arm. Uh, it was just a series of numbers. And that was from when he was a prisoner of war in a German prisoner camp because when he was flying his 25th mission over Germany, his very last one, they got shot down and he was one of two or three survivors. Spent 18 months in a prison camp, uh, never met his daughter until she was like two or three. And so I just grew up having such respect. Even when I was super young, too young to really understand what he had gone through, it still registered with me that he had done something profound and that whole generation had gone through so much. And then obviously as I got older and read history and learned more about that whole era sacrifices that they made, not just overseas, but here at home, like women Mm -hmm. working in the factories and like you read about how many airplanes this nation churned out in such a short amount of time. And I don't have the numbers in front of me. You probably know them. Uh, by heart, but it's just astounding yeah. what we were able to do mm-hmm. kind of rallied together as a people. Um, and so, yes, this topic is, like I said, near and dear to my heart. And um, <clears throat> I've got a, a book here. We won't talk about this, but I'm, I'm just holding it up for people to see that the, the ball turret gunner from my grandfather's crew who was killed in that, in that crash when they shot down, but his nephew went on to write this book and he researched for 10 years, everything about the crew, where they were from, everything that happened that day. There's, they've got flight patterns from their briefing of that morning. He tracked down the the German pilot who shot them down. He tracked down the the kids who were playing on the wreckage outside of this little Austrian town and interviewed them, just phenomenal. So again, I I go off on a tangent here, all to say that I really appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, So let's dive into it a little bit more. How did you find the, how do you find all these guys that you talk to and have talked to over the years? That's That's a great question. And you have to go way back in time. Uh, I, I was working in a, in a company and uh, I'm fairly successful. I, I'd, uh, I'd, now I look back and I'm a living example of the word Peter principle. Have you ever heard about that? That you rise to the level of your own incompetence. <laughs> and I was very fortunate to be able to do that. And I was in a company that at the time was having some leadership challenges. And I was in the middle of it. And it, it, it involved me. I was had my hands dirty to speak. Uh, and I really didn't know what to do. And so as a sidebar, just as kind of an avocation, I was writing for an e-zine, which at the time was one of the first magazines that were published on, on the internet. And I was, uh, I was writing for Macintosh hardware and then specializing in Macintosh hard, hardware and how it applied to flight simulators. As oh. a sidebar, flight simulators were like Microsoft and X Plane and some of these things were really driving computer technology. So it was a big deal. And I think I had a whole audience of something like 800 people a month, but I was influential. And at that time, while I'm having this leadership crisis with my colleagues, and uh, I had, um, this gig writing about technology. And at that time, these World War II veterans were getting their autobiographies published. So my editor was getting books all the time from publicists saying, would you read my book and put a story on the internet? Well, our, 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 uh, our genre really wasn't appropriate for that. But one day, his name was uh, Jean Vitsun, and he's a Canadian. He's a, he was a great editor. But he sent a, sent a book to me, and it was Bud Anderson, who was a triple ace in World War II. It was his book called To Fly and Fight. 
And he just asked me, he says, as a lark, you know, we think that this World War II thing, and this was like 1999, 2000 or something like that, was going to be, a, could be a real boon to our readers and grow, grow our audience. And so I, I got to interview Bud. And uh, I've been doodling airplanes all my life. And uh, so I had uh, told Bud that um, I was going to draw his airplane, make some prints. Uh, I published the interview. It went out and had uh, was well received by an audience. I think I went to like 2000 readers or something like that. And I sent Bud some prints of my artwork and I wanted him to sign them because I knew some other history geeks like me. And I got four back with a little note i sent him five i got four back and i have and i still have this little note it was bud said john your artwork was so nice i kept one i hope you don't mind i was just thrilled okay my boyhood hero because i read about this guy when i was right little. right okay so at any rate i'm these, these two these two stories it sounds like i'm i'm flying around the room and i am but they'll they'll converge well one day i came home and it was a typical bad day at the office i was i was very stressed uh i had again ha was at the very element, very edge of my ability as a professional and as a quote unquote leader, whatever you want to talk about it. And I came home and I did what I always did. I walked in, my wife and my son were having dinner and I just go downstairs. Now, not a good thing, but I, clearly I was immersed in my world. Uh, I went into my studio and I remember sitting down and looking at my phone, my studio at the time was also my home office. I was really privileged. I had offices everywhere, but I looked at that little post-it note and it had Bud Anderson's phone number on it. And I thought to myself, you know, Bud Anderson led people into combat at age 21. I wonder what he would, what advice he would give me. Now you have to understand up until then, I've been through executive leadership coaching programs and all this stuff, read all the books, you know, seven highly habits of, of, uh, you know, finding your cheese or whatever it was. And I, I, uh, I called Bud up and it was seven o'clock central. And I remember it was five o'clock Pacific where he lived. And it was really interesting because this was two weeks after my story about his, there I was at 30,000 feet shooting down Germans. And I asked him, I said, Bud, this is uh, John Mollison. Do you remember me? And he, he right away, he said, well, sure, John, you know, and thanks for the artwork. I'm getting it framed and blah, blah, blah. And I apologized for missing his dinner hour. And he says, no, no, what, what, what do you got to talk about? And so a long, make a long, longer story, a little shorter. I just said, Bud, I'm, here's my situation at work. My colleagues are X, our challenges are this. Uh, we're doing this wrong. I'm screwing up here, blah, 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 blah what would you do? And I'll never forget the 10 second pause. It was 10 seconds. You can count that down, but I, it's a long time. He didn't really say anything. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, great. I just weirded out my boyhood hero, but he said, and I, I wish I had the exact words, but it's something to the effect of John. I wish your generation would talk to us old guys with those kinds of questions because that's what we're here for. And he said, I'll tell you what, if you keep asking old people these questions, you're gonna be rich. You're gonna be far more advanced because this is, the, this is really the, the, the purpose of age. Yeah. And then he said, I know you're interested in World War II aviation. So if you continue to do this with World War II pilots, I'll open up my, he called it Rolodex, but he said, I'll open up my Rolodex and introduce you to anybody you want. And Bud Anderson is a fixture in the World War II leadership ace community. I mean, he's still alive, Google the man, and he's a, an, a truly an American legend. And um, I said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And uh, just to pay for their time, I'll draw their airplanes, make prints made, and then send them to them free of charge so that they can have them for their families. And uh, that began something that has taken me around the world three times and uh, started my blog with, um, with two people reading it, my, myself and my wife, to now I'll get between 12,000 and 14,000 readers a month. And the, my artworks in 
galleries and museums and collections in 14 countries, maybe, maybe more, or maybe somebody took it, moved it, you know, maybe now it's 13 or 12, I don't know. But it turned into something way bigger than I ever thought, you know, I, from pencil sketches to being in films, you know, I've, we've had film premieres in, in London for Pete's sake, you know, wow. it, it, uh, it's, it's really been an amazing, amazing story and how it's affected me continues to grow. Like just this past Friday, uh, I was asked to, to design a book, a book cover for a group of veterans. And, you know, one of them is an Apollo astronaut and three POWs uh, and all these people there. I mean, these aren't just simply distinguished vets. They're extremely distinguished vets. And, you know, so I'm here in this room. I'm the only non-military, I'm an artist, I'm a writer, you know, and yeah. these guys are, you know, <laughs> fighter pilots and POWs. And I mean, and they've, they've got like, not just, I mean, lots of medals, silver stars, DFCs, all this stuff. And, you know, being an Apollo astronaut is pretty freaking cool. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and I'm sitting here going, you know, I, I'm living a life that so many people would just love to meet these people. And to me, they're buddies. It's changed everything in my head. It is, it, it has taken me in a completely different trajectory. And I'll, um, I know I'm talking too much, but I'll, I'll, no, I'll stop with good. this. It, I, I was, Oh, it was about four years ago. I had uh, somebody that I was getting interviewed somewhere and uh, they had asked me if there was any consequence to what had, what I've been doing. And I had to think about it. And I, and I thought, well, you know, one thing it's done is it's rendered me almost unemployable because when, when you have mentors and relationships and when i get to know when i interview these old guys I, I it's not a 90 minute interview there are a few of them but most of them i've stayed in their home <clears throat> excuse me i know they're you know their spouses made me dinner you know <laughs> we're friends they, they become yeah. grandparents to my kids it it's it's made me unemployable because i've worked with the most accomplished best leaders ever and no so no sense of celebrity status no sense of c-suite corporate climbing among them and very little vanity yeah but at the same time you get the duty honor country courage character and it's overwhelming so when i find myself uh you know in in the normal world in the real world Sometimes it's kind of, um, it's, it's challenging to go, oh, wait, you know, I've had the best training, period. Right. I've been around the best of the best, period. John, just calm down and <laughs> see if you've got something to offer the situation rather than just walking away going, I can't deal with this, you know? <laughs> so it, it's, uh, it's been, it's been uh, extraordinarily, extraordinarily uh, enriching and I'm very privileged. I don't know if I deserve it, but I like to think that my readers, uh, I'm doing what they want to do. And so I've got a burden and I've got a responsibility to do it and not screw it up. Yeah. Well, I think that you're right. It is a responsibility. It's a privilege, but it's a responsibility because if not you, who? Yeah. And yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's a, that's a, a tough one because in some ways um, it, 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 it is kind of my, my calling. I mean, I grew up drawing these airplanes when I was a little kid and I know their world. I know their, their, at least their world, at least enough to broach a conversation. And as the, the experience in the organism of interviewing these old guys and drawing their airplanes grows, uh, I know the world better. And as a creative, quote unquote, you know, uh, I've lived in art and I've lived in writing and I've lived in media production. I can see how, uh, if you want to call it, God has given me this task. So I, if not who, uh, it is my job and it is my responsibility. And I've been very fortunate to actually get paid to do it. Yeah. Which is unbelievable. <laughs> it is so cool. 
Yeah. yeah. We're going to be sure to link to, you know, ways that guys can watch the films that you've produced. I've, I've been able to sit down and watch a couple so far. They're not just interesting. They're just, they're well done and they're compelling. And to, to hear these stories from the mouths of these men, it's yeah. just, it's amazing. And yeah, what a privilege, like you said, to, to be next to them in the same room and, and form these friendships with guys who, you know, they're not going to be around much longer, sadly. Yeah. And that's what, yeah, one thing I think is really cool is I get to have creative expression and I've, I'm, I'm starting to get good at it. I don't think I'm really good at it yet, but I'm starting to, but I get the chance to have creative expression. But at the, on the other hand, I, it, there's really not any room for my ego because I'm dealing, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not a great artist when you're dealing with uh, an Apollo astronaut, you know what I'm saying? I'm just simply doing my job. And I really like the gig. I, going to a film premiere, it sounds all glamorous and all this other cool stuff and winning awards and all the, that stuff. But it's, there's a built-in humility to it. And you just go, you know what? I'm just doing my job. Right. And that's what you hear from all of them. Uh, I was James McDivitt this, uh, this, this Friday, um, I was at the book setting and he and I were talking and he looked at me and, and he was being interviewed by a reporter yeah, the reporter was right next to me, but he had looked at me and he said something to the effect of, John, just tell him I was doing my job. And I just happened to have an extraordinary job. This podcast is part of the Edify Podcast Network. Edify is a faith-inspiring app that brings together thousands of the best Christian podcasts in one place for your listening enjoyment. Cut through the noise and grow your faith by diving into the world's top Christian podcasts today. Download the Edify app for free from the App Store or Google Play or by going to edify.app. That's E-D-I-F-I dot app. In my case, you know, with my, my grandfather, who I mentioned was in a uh, POW camp, he did not like to talk about what he had been through. Did you, you run across that often? Mm, initially, it, it's... um. Well, first of all, there's a that's a great question because it illustrates um, it illustrates the difference in generation, and it it illustrates I think uh, I think somehow the role of uh, of experience and trauma in people's life. So initially, World War II veterans, they were, you know, they were among the toughest people to crack because when you, you meet with them and, and talk with them, uh, their first answers were always, oh, it was nothing. I was a cook. Oh, nothing. No big deal. You really have to prove yourself to them. So that's why my interviews took longer than 90 minutes on a phone. You know? You'd have to go visit them. Yeah. Uh, you'd have to, they'd have to know who you were, meet your kids. And I don't know if it was a trust, but I think uh, once people understood that I was sincere and I was truly wanting to know, then they opened up and talked just like anybody else. And uh, you could get them to not shut up. But it, it's, it was an initial thing. And I think the, from my experience, at least when you hear that generation not wanting to say anything, it's really maybe a screening mechanism. Because what I've learned is that combat, when you're in a position of mortal combat, especially the people who are infantrymen and seeing more of the gruesome aspects of war, that's a brotherhood that if, if you don't, yeah. if you've never been there, you can't appreciate it. Yeah. It's, and it's locked in their brains. In you, the, sometimes you don't want to dig it out. Sometimes right. they're asking for you to dig it out. And then once you dig it out, you got to figure out what to do with it. It's a true story. I, uh, I was able to uh, volunteer for um, four of those honor flights. And I remember the talking to a, a gentleman who had earned his combat um, infantry badge in uh, the Philippines in World War II. He was describing what it was like to just be day to day and uh, doing what he did. And then he his uh, group of uh, soldiers that were with him were obliterated in a friendly, friendly fire strike. Oh, wow. And he lost it on the bus. 
I'm, you know, here I am talking to him and he lost it. Um, and it was a, a sob that I, I haven't heard uh, before and I never want to hear again. But afterwards, we we're all getting off the bus. He and I were the last two off the bus. And, uh, you know, I, I knew better than to say, I'm really sorry, because you, that's something you don't say. Oh, you know, usually you now it's, it's, hey, do you want to go get a beer or, or uh, you know, you want me to hang out or you want to be left alone? And he said, um, he goes, well, that hadn't come out ever. And, mm. but he said, thank you. So, you know, sometimes, wow. sometimes the, the stuff that's hidden, they want it to come out, but they're just not quite sure how. Yeah. Again, what a privilege to, I mean, it's, it's tough to witness, but what a privilege to be the one who gets to witness that coming out for the yeah. first time. Yeah, there's got to be a better word for it because it's then privilege. Yeah. And, and I'm not criticizing you for it. No, uh, you're right. There's... We're trying to find the right word. That's happened enough in, in my life. And it's as, I mean, it's, it's incredible when, when you're the first person to hear a combat story. Uh, can I give you another one? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay this, one, this one totally changed my life. I was talking to a, a, a Corsair pilot and he flew in the Korean War, and he was uh, he was a FAC forward, or in basically a, you know flying above a part of North Korea at a very famous battle called Chosin. If you, if you want to ever learn about an American military failure, it's Chosin. And I'm, I won't give you the uh, the whole background because we don't have enough time. But essentially, some uh, American Army and Marines. Soldiers were absolutely overwhelmed by Chinese. It was definitely, definitely South Dakota cold. And we got our butts kicked. And uh, this pilot was flying over, uh, over the, the battlefield at the time. And he watched a wave of Chinese, and it was maybe 50,000, come over a hill and descend on a small, if you yeah, company. I don't, I don't know how many soldiers, uh, our guys there were, and just start mowing them down. And so he, uh, he, and this is also a World War II pilot. And up until then, he had been interviewed uh, a number of times on his World War II stuff, but nobody had ever asked him about his Korean War experiences. Oh, his name is Sam Folsom, by the way. If you go to my blog, you can look up Sam. But Sam starts describing what he was seeing. And his conversation went from very professional, uh, articulate, and you know, practiced and rehearsed to the pitch of his voice went a little higher, a little higher, and he started talking in first person. And he started talking quickly. And the energy in his voice just rose and rose and rose as he's describing the waves of the Chinese. And he's starting to not make sense. Um, I, I could go into play acting here, what it sounded like, and it would really do him a disservice. But he's on my, I'm, I'm talking to him on the phone and he's clearly agitated. And so he starts to describe how he's run out of bullets and run out of ordnance on his Corsair. And he's flying down a hill and he's trying to hit Chinese with his propeller. Wow. And he's, he's mad. And he's not talking about it in the past. He's talking about it as if it's happening. Yeah, and totally talking, reliving it. Yeah, totally reliving living it. Talking about throttle, talking about flap settings because he's that low. I mean, a Corsair propeller is pretty big, but you're still 10 feet off the ground. And he's talking about hitting the Chinese and hating them and, and realizing he has to go home because he's low on fuel. He's helpless. He lands. And as he talked about what it was like to get out of his airplane and, and uh, go back into the HQ, uh, then he was then more circumspect, called down. But at this time, he is sobbing, crying, and wailing. Uh, and I, as, as we got off the phone, I mean, I just said, Sam, I'll, can I call you back? And no, 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 no. He put the phone down, I remember, and he walked away for like 10, 15 minutes came back, picked up the phone and said, okay, let's pick up where we left off. 
but I had to call his family. And I said, look, you're, I think I made your dad freak out and here's the deal. And all of his family said, well, geez, we had never heard that either. And I said, well, then just could you go call, check on your dad? Because I want to make sure I didn't open any wounds. Well, a day later, I got a call from Sam and he said, I'm fine. He, he mm -hmm. was grateful. He said, thank you. But I, I didn't expect to tell you that story, but that. I'm glad you did. Yeah, it's in it's. Uh, um, but it's it's the world that I get to step in and you know, I get to report what I see in here. Yeah. Well, and if it wasn't for you again, he probably never would have divulged that to anybody. And it sounds like it was healthy for him to do so. And mm -hmm. we wouldn't, ha we wouldn't have that story to document and, and pass on. So. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it's uh it's the difference in the generation, the Korean war vets, um, well, world war two guys will tend to just downplay it but they really realized that they were part of something incredible. Korean war vets will talk about, will talk about their stuff, but they, they figure they want to talk about it, but nobody cares. The Korean war is called the forgotten war for right. good reason. Yeah. And then the Vietnam vets that I've talked to most of them uh, really would like to talk about it, but they're it's tinged with, um, and anger and justifiably and frustration yep. that you've got to work through. And uh, so Vietnam War vets take a, a long time to get to know and unpack. Sure. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, a lot of politics going on at that time, and they weren't always well received when they came home. And so I think they, yeah, they're they're rightfully jaded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are, are, our, uh, I've spent some time in Vietnam. I got to teach in Hanoi and I've made a couple of films over there. And it's kind of interesting when you get over there and, and you see how prosperous the country is and how that is one country that's got its act together in, in many, many ways. And you come home and you realize, well, you know, maybe the, maybe the United States didn't lose in Vietnam because they're sure acting a lot like, like us, but it, uh, it doesn't that fact doesn't um, solve or soothe a lot of the pains of horrible, horrible leadership in that mm -hmm. war. Yeah, for sure. Well, John, I could keep going down this, this trail of just listening to these stories they are fascinating. Um, but I'm curious, again, you've taught, you've spoken with interviewed close to 70, isn't it? Yeah. A lot more than that, but yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So, you've already kind of touched on you know, what you've learned about leadership, but I'm curious when you think back through all the stories, all the interviews, what have you learned about just being an American? Okay. Here's my thought on this. The first time I went to Vietnam, I was lecturing. Uh, I was a business lecturer at Hanoi University. and I got to develop a relationship with them over time. But the first day I was in Hanoi, uh, I, you know, jet lag and I was wide awake. I hadn't slept for like 36 hours and it, it's jet lag does funny things to your brains anyway. But I was outside uh, the hotel and I was started to count Porsche Panameras. Because, I mean, people don't realize that Hanoi is just full of money. I mean, there was a Bentley in front of my hotel. There was a Rolls Royce in front of my hotel. And there, mm. uh, you know, I like Porsches. So I started counting Porsche Panamera as well. Very soon, I quit counting after 17. Wow. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, where is this third world backwards country that I've read about? Well, clearly it doesn't exist. And Hanoi traffic is unbelievable anyway. But uh, so the gentleman that I was with, he's very familiar with Vietnam. I, 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 he knew that the reason I took this gig to be over there wasn't about teaching business. It was about learning about the Vietnam War. So he was very familiar with Hanoi. And we, he said, look, I'll, we'll take you to some of, the, some of the war scenes or the war uh, museums. And the communists or you know, v Vietnam, I don't believe is really a communist country. It's more like a really benevolent mafia, but he, they, they have these little monuments to the Vietnam War everywhere. It's like every two blocks, there's some you know, sculpture or something like that. So at any rate, I walked into, he took me to a little park 
and the park had a sculpture in it. And if you like, what I'll do is I'll, I'll send you a picture so your, your audience can see it and they can go to your website. Yeah. Because it's an amazing photo. Um, uh, but at any rate, it's a, it's a sculpture of an A1 Sky Raider that has its wings cut off and it's buried into the ground nose down. And so you see the, the tapering of the fuselage and the huge elevator up on top. And it looks like a, a crucifix. Mm. But it's surrounded by all these other American parts, B-52 parts, A-4 parts, F-4 parts, and bombs and stuff like that. And there's a picture, oh, it's probably four feet by six feet, of a Vietnamese girl with, you know, the typical with the coolie hat and this AK-47 slung across her shoulder, dragging a piece of an A-4 Skyhawk through the surf. And it's kind of a blue colored photo. And again, I'll send you a photo on this, but I'm sitting here looking at this sculpture of ruined American parts, ruined American equipment. And it's clearly a sculpture to the triumph of the Vietnamese people rising up against you know, the huge American aggressor. But I'm looking at this thing and I, this is what happened. Um, I got overcome with emotion. I couldn't even really cry because I'm sitting here thinking, we're in a country that is so free and it's so strong and it's so powerful that we can go in the world and right or wrong, still die for causes that we believe in. And then I think to myself, how many Vietnamese would come and die for an American on our soil, right or wrong. And yet we do that, right or wrong. Mm -hmm. We live in that kind of country. And there is a terrific responsibility to being number one. There's a terrific humility to being number one. And I thought about the nearly 50,000 Americans that were killed in the Vietnam War. And I'm thinking these guys just did it because they believed in the American cause, right or wrong. And we were able to, to right or wrong, help. That was a humbling moment. And I saw the, the burden of leadership and the burden of once you are powerful, you've got to do something. To me, it was uh, the most patriotic moment I've ever had. And I've had a ton of patriotic moments. So it's kind of ironic. I'm looking here at this cross <laughs> of uh, American iron. And it's obviously a, a testimony to somebody else's triumph. But it's ironic that I looked at it and saw this is a story of American fallible grace. Mm. And uh, so for me, I was just, that was it. And um, very proud to be an American. Uh, I, I think that right now, when I hear people complain about America and complain about the systems and processes that have brought us here and want to rewrite or, or throw everything out, you know, whether it's on the right or the left, I think to myself, have you ever gotten out of this country? Have you ever traveled? Have you ever thought about something bigger than yourself? Right. You know, two of my two people in my, in my pantheon. I got to know Joe Foss before he died and I got to know George McGovern before he died. Now, ideologically and politically, you can't get further apart than those two. <laughs> One's a raving liberal, the other's a raving conservative. But those two men, to me, still embodied the American spirit of duty, honor, and country. Um, there was very little guile in those men. And so... To me, it's, it's, it gets back to that burden then again of how, do, how, do, how can I communicate the humility and sense of responsibility, especially in today's vanity and celebrity culture, which is absolutely worthless. Yeah. yeah. So. Great perspective. Uh, and I, did not, I did not expect that answer, but I like it. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. Um. Man, we are flying through our time. I've got a couple more questions if you've got time. Yeah, I'll try to be brief. Sorry about that. Oh, no, this is good. This is why I had you on. 
<laughs> um, what do you think? And it's kind of related to the last question, I guess, to a certain degree, but when you compare today's fighting aged men and women, how do you think they stack up against the greatest generation when we think of those old guys that you draw their airplanes? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think I can answer that. That's a great question. Uh, I, I don't think I can answer that though. I'm, I'm completely unqualified other than I, I, I want to say this. I think our military institution is still steeped in deep tradition and still de- steeped in the idea of, and I'll bring back those three words again, duty, honor, and country. Um, I believe that the American freedom uh, still is in enough in our DNA that if we had to fight, we would fight, or if we had to support, we would support, or if we had to sacrifice, we would sacrifice no better, no worse than we ever have. That's a fair answer. So you answered it. (laughs) What do you think with, what's, what's the, what's the biggest thing that we can learn from, um, the men that you have talked with over the years, what's the biggest thing we can learn from them to apply to our daily lives? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's a, that's a question I get asked and that's a question I enjoy answering, but I'm going to have to answer it abstractly. If you look at life as a trajectory, you know, it, it really is. You're, you start in a, a spot where you really don't have any control. You know, Jeff Bezos didn't have any control where he grew up, how he became. Uh, just, you didn't have any control. I mean, maybe in the cosmosphere, there is some sort of interchange between us and the divine being about where we get to be on earth. Maybe this is just a giant school. I don't know. But for the most part, we don't know. We don't get a choice. And our life takes a certain trajectory. And somewhere along the line, we can affect our course a little bit. I don't think a lot. You know, you, I always ask that question of veterans. Do you believe in fate? Do you believe in predestination? Do you believe in God? You know, why you? Why not you? But life has a trajectory. And we can affect it somewhat. But that little tiny, those little tiny decisions that can really affect a predetermined trajectory over time measure huge. Mm -hmm. You start out and you make a little millimeter deviation and 90 years later, you're one way or you're another. Yeah. And so the answer is that you're looking for is I, I, I tell people that your life is a trajectory and you're making these little tiny decisions right now. You you couldn't control where you started and and your end is, you know, that's the hand of God, the hand of fate, whatever you want to call it. But these little tiny decisions, you've got to start thinking about, well, you know, where's this going to be 40 years from now? Because it will come up. The decisions we make now affect us long-term and way out there the choice we make, the values that we want to embrace, the decisions we make and why we make there are those decisions. Uh, I think that's one of the benefits of having old people in your life is because you can have somebody who's been around the block for 80 years uh, come, come up alongside. And if they've lived a, a positive life, they've lived a successful life. They also have a whole lot of pain and suffering in their lives, just like everybody else. And they can come in and coach and they can, they can uh, suggest through relationships, hey, you know, don't do that. Or, you know, you might want to think about this <laughs> because I'll tell you what, you know, in the next five years will be great, but 40 years from now, you might end up with this. Mm -hmm. Uh, most of the old people that I know, I mean, a matter of fact, I'd say a hundred percent, maybe minus one or two have never been dictators to me. I mean, they've all been people who are willing to know me, to mentor me, to coach and to help me be a better person. But it's that idea of a trajectory that we're all on and every decision we're making today may seem insignificant and probably is, but it may not be because it might be leading us somewhere way down the road yeah it's like that old talking head song you know um you know how did i get here (laughs) (laughs) well we're all getting there yeah 
so the little decisions we have control we don't but then again we have control but we don't yeah yeah so i think of life as a trajectory and i've seen the best of these old people and yeah so that's what i think you can take away life is a trajectory be careful about your inputs <laughs> i love that answer yeah we need to embrace um those wise older people out there well we still can yeah. uh wise the people the people who've been through combat uh and the people who've been through the type of training of the people that i've met they're extraordinarily qualified you know they you, she's you know like i have to say this and then I'll, I'll promise i'll be quiet but last summer i was able to or last fall excuse me uh interview brigadier general uh charles mcgee he was a tuskegee airman and uh, i'll send you a link to that interview but you know he, he wouldn't talk about the race car he just wouldn't and that was really interesting he he wouldn't he, and he afterwards i asked him i said you know you just won't go there will you and he goes no I'm, it's not worth talking about and effectively the answer he gave me is it, it doesn't go anywhere all it does is rile people up mm. we have to go towards productive and uh, uh, positive means yeah so and he's 100 years old that's wisdom talking right there though right when a hundred year old guy who's been through racism been through war been yeah. through blah, 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 gives you some advice. That's cred. I listen. Yeah, absolutely. And if we want to be wise, we should listen to what they have to say. Wise people always seek more wisdom. So mm -hmm. that is a great reminder. John, this has been so much fun. I've got one more question. Yeah. Um, obviously, everything that we are talking about, everything that you do has to do with legacy. You're, you're archiving legacy, if, if nothing else, legacy of our aeronautics and our, you know, <laughs> uh air force and all that but you're documenting the legacy of all of these important um men but when you hear the if if you were to leave a legacy that conjures up a certain image but if you pair it with the word inspired if john mollison wants to leave an inspired legacy what does that mean to you hmm. wow that's a that's a question I, I want to answer because I believe uh, if I can do a little bit of me here, you know, I'm not a, a, a great, powerful Christian, uh, but I do have a faith. And I believe that as a creative person, everything I do is inspired. I, I haven't, I'm, I'm not a skilled person. I'm not like a surgeon who was taught how to cut an eyeball or something like that, or an engineer or a, a cook who can, you know, follow a recipe brilliantly or alter that or whatever. I'm, I'm a creative. And that means I'm pretty much functionally useless <laughs> until I get inspiration. Yeah. And I, nobody, I don't know where it comes from. And I've yeah. hung out with my creative friends. We, we don't know where it comes from. It's a thing. It's an organism. And I believe that when you're given a gift or an opportunity, for anybody, you've got a duty to it. So any, any legacy I leave behind, I want people to see the hand of God in what I've done, because that means then I've been a good uh, steward for that. That's my inspired legacy. legacy. I want pe and people do, they look and they go, John, you're the luckiest guy in the world. I go, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> good uh because it because it's beyond luck but you're identifying the source yeah well man you're doing it you're doing it and again i i love the work that you're doing this has been incredibly interesting and i've really enjoyed um hearing your story and getting to know more about uh, what it is that you do thank you for your time and thank you for the work that you do yeah thank you Guys, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's conversation, share it with a friend and subscribe to the show so you don't miss future episodes like the one you heard today. And be sure to check today's show notes for all the ways you can stay plugged into the Inspired Legacy, including my free download called Nine Ways to Be a Better Dad. You can sign up for my free weekly devotional called Inspired Inbox. And you can join the private Facebook group, a community of other like-minded men looking to become the best husbands and fathers they can be. So get plugged in. 
like, subscribe, leave a review, and help more guys find the show because we need more men battling together for the sake of the next generation. Until next time, live inspired.